record to the cloud. So we're going to build a 2D axisymmetric model. Go ahead and click that one. Since I just started the recording, I should tell you, if you're just joining us on the recording, uh, we're building a, a model of a particle in an uh, infinite fluid to measure Stokes's drag coefficient or Stokes's, uh, Stokes's drag force. Uh, the types of physics that we're going to need, I'm going to close recently used because your list might not look like my list, um, is going to be under fluid flow. Um, still single phase flow because we've just got water flowing across our sphere. Um, and then our options are turbulent laminar or creeping. Laminar is not a, a bad choice here, but we're actually working on very, very low Reynolds numbers. Um, and as I had mentioned a minute ago, the special name for very, very low Reynolds number is creeping flow. Um, and so we're going to select creeping flow and add that to our physics. And that's going to be the only model um, that we require is just creeping flow. Uh, go on to the study. Um, we want everything to be stationary. So this would be very similar to what would happen if the, the particle had not reached its terminal velocity um, and it was no longer accelerating. Um, if you wanted to try to simulate what would actually happen when you first let go and it starts to fall and accelerate, you could do a time dependent study, um, but we're not interested in that. Um, the, the Stokes drag force is just for um, stationary studies. No, don't save that. Go ahead and click done. Uh, we will generate our model. Let's see, I'm going to, there we go, try and make that a little bit more visible to everybody. We are going to start with our parameters like we did before. So we're going to set that sphere at the middle and we're going to give it a radius. Um, I tend not to call the radius R a lot uh, because COMSOL can have its own uh, variable called R throughout the problem. So it can get a little bit um, confusing, excuse me, whether you're using your own R or if you're using COMSOL's R. So we're going to change the uh, definition of what it means to be the radius of the particle to be A. Um, and so we're going to go into our parameters over here. We're going to give it A as our name. Um, we're going to start off our particle as one centimeter in radius. Uh, and then we're just going to give it a description of particle radius. We're going to come back to our parameters um, in a moment um, because we're going to add more parameters to it. Uh, but for now, we just need A. By the way, stop me in group chat. I don't have any checkpoints for this model because there's only there's like two domains that we're going to have for this entire model. So there's not a lot to build here. Um, but I didn't post anything. So if, if you get behind, let me know and we can try to get you up to speed. Um, next thing we're going to do, we're going to add the particle itself to our um, model. So under geometry, I'm going to right click and I'm going to select a circle. The radius is pretty easy. We're going to change our, our circle to just have a radius of A because that's what our, our sphere is going to have a radius of. The sector angle, um, typically I just play around with this until I get it to be what I want. So for example, if you were to change your sector angle to 90 degrees and then click build selected, what you see is you've got about half of a circle, right? You've got the upper half of your circle. Um, so we want our sector angle to be 180 because that'll give us the other half of the circle. And then I'll zoom out. But now you can see that it's, it's sort of the wrong way, right? The, the axis that we've got here for R is equal to zero. That's our axis of symmetry. And we want to be able to sort of imagine this uh, sphere as rotated around that axis of symmetry. If we were to rotate it around there, we would kind of have like a, a half dome, um, which is not really what we want. Uh, and so we also now have to rotate our circle. Um, so I'm going to rotate that by 90 degrees and build selected. It's kind of the, that would work um, if it was on this particular side, but for whatever reason, I like to have my sphere on the other side. Um, there's nothing wrong with it built this way other than it, it seems a little bit odd to be sort of in the negative space. Um, so I'm just going to rotate that by nine, minus 90 instead um, to flip my uh, circle over to here. How does circle one pop out? Uh, if I right click on geometry and then select circle, um, that's how I got my circle to show up on here. That was a question in chat, by the way, that I was just asking. So this is our, our circle. It's going to be a uh, solid, right? It's, it's not going to um, 
do anything. It's not going to move around. In fact, as we go, it's actually not even going to have any properties to it because um, we're going to use a little trick in Comsol that can, again, help speed up calculations. Uh, and we're going to be doing stuff that takes a, a kind of a lot of calculation power. So, or at least it does on my machine. The other component that we need is the fluid. Um, we, there's no option in Comsol to just say, do this in an infinite fluid. You always have to have a domain. Um, and so the domain that we're going to use is something that scales with the size of the sphere. Um, so if our sphere is of radius A, uh, if that's my eyeball that's on here, we want to try to define a domain that's, that's fairly large relative to that size because we're trying to simulate an infinite fluid. Um, so the domain will have to be fairly large. Um, in order to do that, we're going to add a rectangle. So right click on geometry and select rectangle. We're going to make the rectangle scale with the size of the sphere. Um, and so we're going to make its height. Uh, let's see, what do we want to do? Maybe let's do five times a for its um, height. And for its width, we'll do maybe eight times a. We're just kind of making up numbers here for the moment. 8a and 5a. And we'll go ahead and click Build Selected. And we're going to take a look at our geometry here. So what we would like is if this, if this particle is um, falling down through um, a fluid, that is equivalent to the particle staying stationary and the fluid flowing up past the particle. Um, and those are kind of some of the tricks you have to do inside of, of Comsol. We can't actually in a stationary study, make the sphere move at a constant speed. Um, we could, but we'd have to use a time-dependent study, and it probably wouldn't be particularly accurate because it would be uh, sort of chunked up over time. Um, and so we want this steady flow of fluid from the bottom to the top of our domain. Um, and we'll be able to visualize this here in a minute if it, if it doesn't seem particularly clear what we're doing. In order to do that, we have to have our sphere sort of in the middle of our um, geometry. So I have to take that rectangle and shift it down a little bit. So I'm going to make its um, base. I'm going to start shifting its base down a little bit um, and go at about, mm, let's see, what would that be? Minus 2.5 times A, I think, would shift it down. So that the center of the sphere is right at zero. Um, and then as well, our uh, rectangle is um, centered at z is equal to zero. So there's a little bit down here and there's a little bit up here. Imagine the fluid sort of flowing in from the bottom of this. It's going to kind of bend around the sphere um, and then come out through the top. Or at least that's our, our goal, right? If, if we can get it to work in that particular way, then great. Um, that's what we're going to end up doing on here. Um, our, our next trick that we're going to do uh, is something that you can do in Comsol if you've got what you anticipate to be a fairly lengthy computation. Um, you can ask Comsol to not include certain portions of your domain. Um, so for example, nothing interesting is ever going to happen inside of this sphere, right? It's a a solid particle, the fluid's just going to hit it and move around. So we don't have to tell Comsol to waste time calculating what's happening inside of that sphere. We can actually have it remove um, that domain from its calculation, and that'll save it some time because it doesn't have to calculate quite as much. In order to do that, if you right click on geometry, uh, the type of operation we want is called a Boolean. Um, or a petition, but, or a partition, but we're not partitioning anything. Um, and we're going to do a, a difference, right? We've got two geometries set up here. We've got a large rectangle and we've got a circle, and we want to take the circle out from the um, rectangle, right? We want to cut it out. So we're going to use a difference Boolean. Um, and then the uh, interface that's here is what uh, domains do you want to be present and what domains do you want to remove? So if you click on the little button over here for activate selection, we can now select which of those domains do we want to actually be present. Um, it may have automatically selected the rectangle, but if it didn't, select the rectangle again. Um, so you, you should have something that looks like R1. And then under objects to subtract, um, click the activate selection button over here. And this will then allow you to select the circle over here. You have to be a little bit careful, kind of aim your cursor out towards the edge of the circle. If you're towards the center of the circle, Comsol might think you're trying to select the rectangle. So aim sort of out here towards the edge um, and you'll get just the circle to highlight. And once you've got that, click that. 
And so now you'll see that our objects to add are, is R1 and our objects to subtract is C1. If you then click build selected, uh, you should see that you get a cut taken out of that rectangle. And so what this has told Comsol to do is just don't calculate anything there, right? This space that we've just sort of hollowed out in here is no different than the space that's out here or the space that's up here. It's it's not there as far as the, the simulation is concerned. Um, we, don't, we don't care about that space anymore. Cool. I'll just take a, a pause for a minute if anybody has any questions on how we got our domain. Nada? Okay, so far so good. Um, let's go ahead and define some boundary conditions. Um, so remember, we want flow coming up from the bottom and coming out through the, the top. So we're gonna minimize some of these other ones. Why did we leave out the circle? We left out the circle because nothing's happening inside of there. Um, so we can save some computational time for COMSOL if we tell it just don't calculate anything in there. If we leave it there and make it a solid, um, COMSOL now has to actually devote a little bit of time to calculating what's happening inside of the solid, even though we know that nothing is happening inside of the solid. Um, so we're, we're trying to save some computational time, um, which is why we removed it. So under um, creeping flow, uh, we need to actually, let's go ahead and add our material first um, before we define our boundary conditions. Um, so if you take your materials here and you right click and say add from library or browse materials, any of those would be okay. Um, we need to go through our liquids and gases, or you can go through built-in. Um, both of those should have water in them because water is a, a pretty common one. Uh, just make sure you get water as a liquid um, and either double click that or, or right click it and select it or add to component or, or whatever you wanna do. But make sure you put liquid water in there. The simulation will work just fine if you do something else, preferably not like steel if, if you try to define a flow of a solid, that'll be a problem. Um, but if you were to use like air or alcohol or something like that, the simulation will work fine. We just won't be able to compare the answer um, quite as easily. Notice that when you add water, um, it should be automatically added to the entire domain. So here I've selected water over in my materials. The um, domain that it's in is all of the domains. Um, and so it's been highlighted over here as purple or blue, whatever color you want to call that, um, because it's present in all of the domains right now, except again for the interior of the circle. So again, we've saved some time here by removing the circle because I don't have to try to define that as like steel or something like that. Um, we just said don't care. we don't care about the circle. Um, it's just been removed. So that's water. Um, let's go ahead and look at our boundary conditions. Um, Remember the default boundary conditions are always present for all physics. Um, for fluid mechanics, the default boundary condition is that everything is a wall um, or it's an axis of symmetry. So this boundary here is considered an axis of symmetry as is this one, but everything else is automatically defined as a wall. Um, we can leave this one as a wall uh, because that one is our, our sphere. So we want the no slip condition on the surface of our sphere, which is like a wall, um, but we want to change this bottom sphere to be an inlet, um, and then we're going to change both of these other two to be um, open boundaries. So they will be open for anything um, to happen for them. So if you right click on the word creeping flow, all of your boundary conditions should show up. Um, and so we want to add an inlet, which is the second one down. Uh, once we have our inlet, we have to select which boundary we want. So the inlet's going to be coming in through the bottom. The boundary condition that we have for an inlet flow is going to be fully developed. 
And so this is where we would define how fast is the particle moving, right? The equivalent of a particle moving down at one meter per second is the flow uniformly going up at one meters per second. So we can kind of set that to be anything that we want, but since this is um, creeping flow, we should try to keep it to be, you know, something that's fairly slow. Um, so we're going to define the um, average velocity across the bottom here as pretty small. Um, we're going to make this 0 0.1 centimeters per second. So that corresponds to our one centimeter radius sphere steadily moving down um, at a velocity of 0 0.1 centimeters per second, which is pretty small. If you calculate the Reynolds number for that, it'll be pretty small. Next thing, we want to um, define these two uh, as open boundaries. So we don't have any pressure conditions or stress conditions or anything like, well, we do have a stress condition, um, pressure or flow conditions for anything over here. We want MATL or COMSOL to behave as though these were open and fluid can sort of come and go as it needs to across those two boundaries. So if you right click on creeping flow, um, another of the boundaries that's on here is open boundary. So we'll select open boundary. And then we select the two um, edges over here. So there's one on the top and one on the side over here. Yeah, so there's a question in chat about the um, units on the uh, inlet flow rate. Uh, it already has a unit of meters per second, but you can override any of the default units inside of COMSOL by providing your own units in brackets, as I've done over here. So when I say 0.1 with a bracket centimeters per second, I have told it to treat it as though it has this unit. Internally, sort of like under the hood when it's doing its calculations, COMSOL will convert it to meters per second. Um, but you can override those defaults by providing a unit like this. So we've got flow coming in down here through the um, bottom portion. Um, and we've got what we call open boundaries over here on the side. Uh, and then our sphere should be our wall, right? So there's, there's no slip um, on top of the sphere or on the surface of the sphere. And the last thing that we want to do is set the mesh. Um, and this is something we're going to come back to in a moment. So the, the mesh is not going to stay uh, with what we've got right here. Um, but we need to start with um, a mesh somewhere. So underneath creeping flow, you should have mesh one. Um, if you click on mesh one, you should be under the physics controlled mesh. Um, and we're going to set these fairly low for the moment. Um, so I'm going to go all the way down to coarser. And then click build all. And you should get a mesh that looks something like this. Again, we're going to revisit the idea of the mesh here in a moment because it's pretty important. Um, but for now, we're okay with a coarser one. Once you've got a coarse mesh set up, you should be able to go ahead and run your study. So under study one, um, you can click compute. And if I missed anything along the way, we're going to let COMSOL tell me um, if we have any errors or anything like that. The first simulation is usually the longest um, after you finish the simulation. For the first time, uh, it retains some of those um, data sets or data structures. And so it goes a little bit um, faster after the first one. So. If we're uh, looking at this, um, we can see that there's plenty of flow out here um, sort of in the undisturbed region that's far away from the sphere. Uh, it's obviously stopped near the sphere. Do you need to reset it to run it again? No, you don't. Have, just click compute and it'll rerun. Um, although I don't usually like to say update solution because that usually doesn't update everything that I've changed. Um, so compute is the, the way to go. So on your um, velocity uh, surface plot that looks something like this, uh, we can see that there's this sort of like wake area behind there. It's not actually a wake. Well, it is a wake, um, but there's no uh, pressure drop due to um, boundary layers back here. So um, the drag is all surface drag in this particular case. Um, but what we're really interested in is what's happening there on the surface of the, the sphere, but also what's happening out here. Um, and so we're going to get to that in a moment. If you just want to verify that indeed what you're doing 
looks the way that it should look. I think these uh, 3D images are just so neat. Um, so if you click over on the velocity 3D, it'll show you, well, what was the implication of your assumption that you were rotating this all the way around? Um, did you actually get a sphere? Um, and we did, right? If, if I zoom in here a little bit, that's kind of a neat little picture of a, a sphere that's um, sitting there. I can kind of rotate around it like this um, and verify that, yep, that thing's a sphere, which is exactly what I needed it to be. But, you know, this is mostly good for the sort of sanity checks, right? Just to make sure that the geometry is what you wanted. Um, you usually can't learn too much from a, a, an image like this um, because you can't really do calculations or anything like you can with um, velocity over here. The point that I wanted to, uh, that I brought up a moment ago about coming back to is the two things that are interesting are what's happening on the surface of the sphere, but also what's happening far away from the sphere. Remember, our assumption of Stokes flow is that this is happening in an infinite fluid. Um, and so there should not be any variations in the velocity that are way outside of the uh, sphere, right? So if I go out here, all of that velocity along this outside edge should look as though the, the sphere is not there. Right, because if you go really, really far away from the sphere in an infinite domain, um, it should look as though the sphere were not there at all. Um, and so we want to check whether or not the sphere that's located here is having any effect on the velocity distribution out here. If you look at the surface plot as we've done here, it kind of looks like now nah, things seem to be okay because um, it's all kind of this dark red. Um, but that's usually not good enough, right? A, a surface plot is good for pretty pictures, um, but it, it doesn't really help you analyze the system in uh, the level of detail that we need. So what we're going to do is add um, streamlines. So what we're going to do uh, is underneath our results here, we're going to right click and we're going to select 2D plot group. So we're going to create a brand new plot group. Um, when you create a 2D plot group, you should look, oop, let me uh, change that back to where it was. There we go. Uh, you should get the domain that looks um, just like this. If you right click on the 2D plot group that you just added, um, what we want to do is add um, streamlines. So there's a, a built-in um, plot inside MATLAB called streamlines whenever you add um, fluid mechanics or any of the fluids physics to your simulation, you should have the streamline as an option here. It actually shows up on more than just that, but it's here for this. Um, and now if you want the streamlines to show up, the easiest way to get sort of what we understand as uh, streamlines is not on selected boundaries, but down here on streamline positioning, switch on selected boundaries to uniform density. So this was the part that I changed down here. How do we open plot groups? Yeah, right click on results. Um, and you should have see the option for a 3D, a 2D, or a 1D plot group, and you want to select a 2D plot group. Once you've added the 2D plot group, right-click on that group where it actually showed up, um, and then select a streamline, which is up around here. You're welcome. And then once you've got your streamline, um, change your positioning under streamline positioning, change it away from on selected boundaries to uniform density. Um, and that should give you a, a plot that looks like this. It's up to you how many streamlines you want. You can mess with the separating distance and get more streamlines or less, but the default 0.05 seems to have worked okay for us right now. And so now we can kind of see how much influence that sphere really has. Certainly the streamlines bend around the sphere itself, which is what we would expect. Um, but we definitely see that the streamlines are no longer straight when they're leaving the domain up here on the top, and they should be, right? If this is an infinite fluid or, or semi-infinite, if that's the way that you want to think about this, um, by the time the fluid exits our domain, it should look as though the, the particle were not there at all. Similarly, out here on the edge, we can still see an influence of the sphere because this line is not perfectly straight, right? That line gets a little bit closer to the outside edge, which means fluid is actually being pushed off of our domain a little bit, and we don't want that. Um, so what we need to do is mess with the size of our rectangle um, until we get something that's uh, basically not changing anymore, right? It, it should be um, the same as, or uh, uh, 
visualization similar to as though the sphere were not there. We're going to do a little bit better than just visualizing it here in a minute. Um, but what we want to do for now is, is just what, what can we play with to make that better? The thing that we can play with is the size of our domain. We can also play with the mesh setting, um, and we're going to come back to the mesh in a moment. Um, but for now, we're, we're going to um, worry about the um, domain instead of the, the mesh. So what we want to do is ask um, Comsol to go through uh, and sort of increase the size of the domain until things stop changing. Um, in order to increase the size of the domain, we can go back to our um, definitions under um, global definitions where we've got these uh, parameters. Um, and we can define our width of our rectangle here and our height as additional parameters. Um, so I can say something like rectangle width. Uh, I think what we had done previously was something like eight times A. So this is our domain width. And our rectangle height, uh, I believe was, was it 5A that we had calculated it as? Domain height. So there's, there's no reason I have to calculate my rectangular width and height um, where I actually create the rectangle. I can define parameters up here so that if I want to change those, I just have to go back to my parameters and not actually dig down to the individual um, geometry in order to find those parameters. So now if I look over at my geometry, I have to update them, which is over here in my um, rectangle. So instead of height as five times A, I want these to be rectangle height, which is the parameter I just created, and rectangle width, which is the parameter that I just created. If you get a little confused about which one was which, just kind of click back and forth between parameters up here. And okay, yep, we called that rectangle width. So my rectangle down here width is rectangle width. Um, and then my uh, parameter here for rectangle height is R-E-C-T sub H. So I put that um, down here as well. And then the only other thing we have to adjust um, is that we want the position to no longer scale with A. We need that to also scale with the rectangle width. So that's rectangle, or sorry, rectangle height um, divided by two. If you click build selected, um, we shouldn't see too much of a change. Um, if you click build all, it'll remove that circle again. So we have the, the rectangle width and the rectangle height um, as adjustable parameters, right? They, we can change those um, as much as we want. How we would now go about changing those to see what happens to our fluid um, may, may depend on which way you want to go about the problem. So one way could be to just manually change those coefficients. So for example, I could just pick instead of 8a, I could pick 10a and 15a and 20a or something like that. Um, and I could change the rectangle height uh, if I wanted to, or if I could keep it constant if I wanted to. Um, it it kind of depends. Um, the way that I'm going to choose to go about doing this uh, is to create a multiplier. So I'm going to imagine I'm going to look at the sphere in a boundary that's this big, and then I'm just going to multiply the boundary by a constant scaling factor, and then another scaling factor, and then another scaling factor, bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, um, until I don't see any more changes anymore. Um, and I'm just going to keep the aspect ratio the same. That's not at all a requirement. It, it entirely depends on what you're trying to investigate with your model. Um, but for this model, because I just want to vary one parameter, I'm going to take each of these and multiply them by something that I'm going to call a scale factor. So I'm going to take that same aspect ratio of 8 by 5 times A, and then I'm going to scale it up. Um, and so my scale factor here I'm just going to define that as one. So now I have I have linked the size of my domain to some sort of a scale factor, right? I could imagine three, four different ways to go about doing exactly the same thing. Um, which, if you do want to do that, you're more than welcome to. Um, you could define them. I don't know. I, I'm sure you can come up with different ways to to scale your geometry, but this is one way to do it, right? If I have a scale factor of one and I build everything inside of my geometry, I get exactly the same thing that I had before. The circle doesn't 
ch change size, right? Only the domain changes size. If I go back to my parameters and I update my scale factor to now be three, and now build my uh, geometry, what you can see is it got quite a bit bigger, um, which is what I wanted, right? The, the scale got bigger, but the aspect ratio stayed the same. And importantly, the sphere stayed the same. So we don't wanna scale up the sphere, right? That's supposed to be the same size in all of our domains, um, but all we're doing is, is ch changing the size of that, that rectangle. And so now I can do this calculation for lots and lots of different um, scale factors. So maybe we'll, let's just leave the scale factor at three and run our simulation again and look at our stream lens. So this was for a scale factor of three. Um, and if I look at my streamlines over here, uh, things are starting to get a little bit better, right? They're fairly uniform. Well, they're always uniform when they're entering the domain. They have now straightened out quite a bit when they're leaving the domain up here on the top. And this domain over here on the right, it's getting better, right? It, it's pretty straight. In fact, if I zoom in on it, maybe we can see a little bit more of its uh, variation. Yeah, you can still see a little bit of variation inside of there, but it's not too bad. How can we do a little bit better than looks good, right? We, ideally, we, have, we should be able to calculate something um, that tells us whether or not this is good enough. It's usually not sufficient to just say, you know, in a report or something like that, oh, I did it until it looked good, right? The, the pixels on the monitor were the way that I wanted them to be. Um, that's usually not a good enough explanation, right? We need to be able to calculate something for it. Um, and so this comes to the idea of what's called uh, domain convergence. So ideally, once we make this thing bigger and bigger and bigger, we will now calculate the same force on that sphere, regardless of what the domain size is, right? There, there's probably some domain at which if you make it any bigger, it has no effect. Um, and that's called domain convergence. And you, we can um, do that with the, the system that we've got here if we add a couple of um, components to it. So the first thing that we want to do is calculate the force, right? We don't want to rely on our uh, image that we've got here as to whether or not those streamlines are straight or not. We want to calculate the force on the sphere because that's a number that um, we know should not be changing um, as we change things. So um, in order to calculate the force on a um, particle, um, we're going to add a line integration, right? We want to take whatever the surface force is all the way along the surface of that sphere and add them all up. Um, when we do that, that's called an integral. Um, so that's what we're, we're interested in doing. So under, um, I believe it's derived values, under results, derived values, right click, there should be an integration option and we want to do a line integral. So click line integral there. The surface over which we want the line integral is the surface of the sphere. So in your drawing, you want to select the two sides of your sphere, as I've done here, the two edges of your sphere. Remember, it's a, a line integral along here, but because the, the domain is 2D axisymmetric, that actually gets repeated all the way around the, the sphere. So we really are calculating the, the force on a surface. It's just because we are 2D axisymmetric, um, the equation that we need is a, a line integral. The thing that we want to add up, right, all of the components along there, um, is the component of the viscous stress that's in the same direction as flow. So there could be vis viscous stress in the R direction or in the phi direction, but drag force is only in the Z direction. Um, so we want to add up all the viscous forces that are in the Z direction that are operating on the surface of our sphere. In order to do that, um, what we have is uh, down here under expression, Again, the, the world's most uh, intuitive symbol for add variable is a green triangle with a red triangle. I have no idea how they chose that. Um, replace expression is what that is. Click on this little fellow over here, um, and we want to navigate through until we can find the Z component of the viscous stress. Um, and so we kind of have to dig around a little bit. Um, some of my window is actually going off the window right now. Um, down here under creeping flow, if you expand that, um, and then expand one more time under auxiliary variables. 
And yet one more time under viscous stress. Under all of those, right? If, if we go under model, component one, creeping flow, auxiliary stress, viscous stress, there's finally the Z component of the viscous stress. That's the thing that we are adding up along the surface of our, our sphere. And so you're gonna um, click that once. Often when you're doing 2D axisymmetric um, simulations, and especially those under very restricted conditions, you can usually get the same answer integrating different things. So if you try to integrate other things like the total stress, you may find that you get the same number. Um, it kind of comes down to what you're trying to calculate. I always try to integrate just the thing that I know that I'm trying to integrate rather than, boy, I hope I understood total stress the way that it should be. Um, and I didn't forget that it also includes some other component. Uh, so I know that the um, drag force is just the viscous force in this case. Um, so I'm going to select that one. So if I double click it, which by the way, if you did not um, see all of those drop downs or you can't find them, you can also just type this directly into expression. You can just type spf.k substress z and that will work too. Uh, it's just you would never know that that was the expression um, without having seen it first. Um, that would be very unlikely um, that you would just guess that that's the parameter that we wanted. So with that, you should be able to click evaluate. Um, and down here in your table one, um, you should see a uh, viscous stress that popped up down here. Actually, let's make a comparison really quick. I think that actually needs to be the total. We might have gotten lucky though. Total stress, Z component. Oh yeah, use the total stress. See, that's how we know. So switch your um, viscous stress, make it the total stress. How did I know that? I'm gonna tell you in a minute how I knew that. So your expression, replace the K and use a T, SPF dot T, sub stress Z. And you should get a number that's like minus 1.97 times 10 to the minus 7. I'm just pausing here for a minute because we're going to use that calculation a lot. So I'm, I'm trying to let everybody catch up to here. All right, I don't see any uh, more questions in chat, so we're gonna stick with this one. Boy, I hope I don't have to come back to that. My notes show two different things and I don't have the full Navier-Stokes sitting in front of me, so I can't check the two. We'll come back and check. We can do everything um, using the total stress for now. So this is gonna be our number, right? Presumably the size of the domain should not change the total stress that we calculate. Once we get to whatever we need to in terms of a large domain, this thing should stop changing, right? We should just keep calculating basically the same stress over and over and over again. Once we have gotten to that domain size, we have achieved what we refer to as domain convergence, right? We have converged to a, a particular domain size um, that pretty much gives the same answer every single time. Why is that important? The reason that it's important is A, the domain should not have an effect, right? The size of the domain, if we're simulating an infinite fluid, should not have an impact on the number that we're calculating. And B, we don't wanna just pick something that's absolutely enormous, right? We don't want it to be any bigger than it needs to be because it's gonna take more computational time in order to do that. Um, and we don't have an unlimited amount of time to do something like that. So one way to figure out, well, where is that sweet spot, right? Where have we gotten just big enough in our domain that it's big enough 
but not any bigger than that, right? We don't need to keep increasing that size. Um, we're gonna achieve that by a parametric sweep. So we're gonna take our parameter over here of a scale factor, and we're just gonna have COMSOL calculate it for a few values. Um, and then we're gonna be able to integrate that total stress um, for each one of those values and plot it to see, well, where did it stop changing? Um, once it stopped changing, then we have found our, our uh, domain size that's appropriate, and we have reached what we call domain convergence. So in order to create a parametric sweep, um, which again, this will come up on your uh, LPCVD reactor a lot because you're going to be doing things like 2K analysis, and it's easier to just tell MATLAB to, to or tell COMSOL to keep um, switching a value rather than you switching it manually. We're going to go into our study. We're going to right click on study one and we're gonna select parametric sweep. So I right clicked on study one, I got a parametric sweep. Underneath the parameter name here is a little plus mark. So it, that's to add a parameter, you can add that. We do not wanna sweep across the size of the particle. Um, so it has automatically selected just the first parameter that we have, which is A, change that to the scale factor. Right, we wanna change our scale factor from a couple different values to um, see when we get to domain convergence. The steps that we're gonna do, um, I usually use this uh, stepping tool down here, the range button. So if you click the little, again, it's like one of those happy little symbols, right? It's a little green line and then some happy little jumps and then a red line over at the top. Um, that's the range button right here. Uh, and we're gonna do a number of, um, values. So our number of values, we're going to start with our original one, right? The original value of the scale factor was just one. Um, and we're going to jump up to, actually, let's, instead of number of values, let's do step. Let's go from one in units of one up to, mm, let's make it big. Let's go up to 20, but change the step size to mm, two, right? So that we don't have quite as many calculations to do. So we're going to start from a scale factor of one. We're going to take steps of two until we get up to 20. Um, and we're going to click add. If um, scale factor is not showing up right here, uh, then you need to click the plus button um, that's down here. And that will allow you to add a parameter. But make sure you've only got one row in here. If you add another row, uh, by default, it tends to do all of the possible combinations, uh, which is a lot. So make sure there's just one row. Once you add it by uh, clicking this um, plus button, if you don't see scale factor in your drop-down list right here, then you probably haven't added it as a parameter yet. Um, and the parameter, the place to add it if you don't have it is way back under global definitions under parameters one. Um, so I actually have a scale factor um, that sits right here. So this, the presence of scale factor here in my parameters list, is what is going to populate my parametric sweep over here to allow me to select those parameters. If I didn't have any parameters, I would not be able to do a parametric sweep. Um, it kind of makes sense, right? You're sweeping over a set of parameters. You gotta have parameters in order to do something like that. Um, now, if you click study one and then compute, Grab yourself a drink, whatever, water, right? Everybody here just drinks water. I'm sure that's all that is. Play some music, because this can take a while, depending on how fast your computer is. Yell at me if that music's too loud. No, we have not yet changed the mesh. We're going to revisit the mesh here in a little bit. So I'm still running this on a coarse mesh. If you upped your mesh, uh, this could take a really long time.
Hey, the ISS is visible on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. You should Google it. Usually it's only visible for like a minute or two, um, but it's going to be visible for almost six minutes on Friday and six minutes on Saturday and six minutes on Sunday, if you're in San Diego. All right, mine has um, computed, but I'm going to wait for probably another two minutes or so um, just to make sure the um, whole group gets up to speed. What's visible? The ISS, International Space Station. So you can get the uh, times and instructions to see it if you go there. Again, my, oh, so my simulation is finished. I'm just waiting another like minute or two because um, I know everybody's, you know, trying to keep up, um, and your simulations might not be done yet. Actually, even better than me just randomly waiting. If your simulation is done, put a yes over on the participants window. Um, vote for yes, and then I'll know how many of you are done. And then once we reach a critical mass of, uh, I don't know, 20 of you or something like that, then we'll move on. So not in, in chat, but go to the participants window and there's a little green check mark um, and you can click yes on that. Alternatively, if you're not doing the simulation, also put a yes in chat. Because if there's only 17 of you doing the simulation, it's going to be a long time. All right, let's let that number get up to, we'll do whichever happens first. Either we hit 30 or we get to 125. Six, so about another three minutes or so. We got about another maybe minute and a half, something like that. We'll stop at 126. I mean, not not stop. We will keep going at, at 126 or whenever we hit 30 yeses over in the participants window. Who knows? Maybe there's 12 people that just have it on and they're not really paying attention. There's a more in there too. Who did more? Oh, somebody needs a break. Well, good. Uh, whoever voted for a break, we're taking a break right now. Hey, it was Dr. O. He needs a break. No. That's right. This is this is pretty upbeat music. Not gonna lie. So about another 30 seconds or so. No break, we just took a break, man. That's like a six minute break. We can't stop science for more than six minutes.
Okay, okay. I'm going to conclude from it being 126 and there being 25 yeses in the chat that there are 25 of us that are doing this simulation. Let's rock and roll. 126. Uh, go ahead and clear that. I will pause the Scheming Weasel. That's the name of the music we're listening to, Scheming Weasel. So you should have something that looks uh, on the order of what we've got right here. Um, basically a giant red field. And what you can kind of see is the sphere down here at the bottom. Um, you can compare streamlines and things like that if you want to. Um, but again, these uh, drawings are, are just sort of there as a sanity check or to look pretty. What we really want to do is check our integration, right? We want to find out, excuse me, where did that drag force stop changing, right? We wanted it to be constant after some particular point. So if you click on your line integration again, you can change the data set, right? Instead of going from solution one, which is just an individual solution, you can change that to your parametric sweep. Before you do that though, clear your table. So if your table only has um, one column in it like this, and you try to use a parametric sweep on that table, Comsol will give you an error that just says your, your table's the wrong size. So there's a little broom sweep button up here on your table. Click that to clear the table so that it looks like this. Then, change your data set from study one. If you click on that drop down, you should have a parametric set of solutions, which is solution two. And you wanna select that one. Once you do that, you can evaluate um, the integral. It'll probably take a moment because it's evaluating that integral for every single uh, parametric sweep step that you took. Once you've got that, um, your table should show now your scale factor. So we didn't get the math dead on, so it took it in steps of two up to 19, which is what it should have done. We asked it for 20, but you can't land on 20 with steps of two the way that we did it. Um, and we can actually visualize or, or look at the numbers here and see that there was quite a bit of variation going from a scale factor of one to three, and even from three to five. But once we hit beyond five, the change became a lot less. Um, and we can actually plot that. There's a built-in way to plot your table. Um, so two to the right of the broom sweep. So there, it's not clear table, um, but the one right next to it is table graph. You can click that and it will plot whatever is in the table. This is a convergence graph. Um, in this case, it's for um, domain convergence. Um, is it normal if the numbers are slightly different in the fourth decimal place? Yeah, that's, that's fine. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about that. Um, Again, what we're looking for is how big do we have to make the scale factor before our integrated total stress is no longer changing, right? We're not evaluating whether or not, whether or not it's right or wrong yet. Um, we're only saying, have we gotten a value that is stable, that doesn't depend on the size of the domain that we have? Um, and we've gone out to about mm, scale factor of 19, and the thing is fairly flat by the time that we've gotten out here. How do we define what's fairly flat and what's not? you would have to choose for yourself how many decimals on your answer down here do you need to be constant. Um, so that if you were to change the domain by a bigger number or to a bigger number, that that number would not change by more than what you want it to change by. Um, and so maybe, you know, if, if our requirement is that it be stable to two decimal points, this would be okay. If we needed four or five decimal points, we may, may need an even larger um, domain which is not possible, or, or which is not impossible. Um, it is also not impossible that the number never stabilizes. Sometimes it can oscillate around a, a value, and then you have to use that um, as your um, best estimate. Uh, that is possible as well. So it looks like by the time we set our scale factor up to about 19, we've got a, a fairly stable um, solution. So I'm just going to hard code my scale factor to be 20 um, and assume that that is, is big enough. So in order to do that, I'm going to delete my parametric sweep because I do not want this thing to keep running through 10 different values of a scale factor every time I calculate it. I just want to fix my scale factor to be um, 20. So in order to do that, I'm going to right click over here underneath study on parametric sweep. I'm going to right click and say delete because I have now done my 
parametric sweep to establish domain convergence. And I have figured out that a scale factor of about 20 is about what I need for that number to stop changing so much. Now I'm gonna go over to my parameters and I'm gonna hard code my, not hard code, I'm just gonna set my um, scale factor to be a constant value of 20. Right, everything here on out will always have a scale factor of 20 um, because that's the one that I want. Yeah, sure, if, if you didn't want, there's a question in chat, could I have just disabled the parametric sweep? Yep, I, th I believe if you right click, there's an option to disable it. I didn't do that because we're gonna do um, more sweeping and I didn't want the, the sweeps to be confusing. Also, I want you to practice adding sweeps because it's useful. So that's, that's one option, right? However, if we look at our, or not one option, one type of convergence, right? One type of convergence is domain convergence, which you can imagine is useless if you have a fixed domain, right? If, if you're calculating flow in a tube or something like that, you can't just change the size of the domain, right? That's changing the size of the tube. But anytime that you have something that is supposed to be interacting with a material that is very large or infinite, like the atmosphere or something like that, um, either you have to get really tricky in the way that you do your boundary conditions, um, or you have to make a really, really big domain so that it behaves as though it is infinitely large. Um, those domains can often be very, very large uh, for forces that scale poorly. So things that scale as like one over the radius, so that drag force actually, the, the disturbance in the fluid scales is one over the radius. And so that requires enormous distances. If it's something like a, a gravita gravitational force that falls off like one over R squared, that one you can probably do um, a smaller domain. But you never really know until you try it um, and run this sort of a, a domain sweep to figure out how big of a domain do I need in order to fix things um, at a constant value. The other thing though was the mesh that we did before. So if you look under your component one, we had done a coarse mesh. Uh, in fact, I had done a coarser mesh. mesh. Um, and if I build that, you can see there's huge chunks of my domain that are mm, being approximated by not very many points on my solver. Um, and worse yet, if I zoom in on the circle, so I'm gonna grab my zoom in over here that circle is supposed to be a smooth circle, right? And if I zoom in, the way that it's actually being approximated is with these facets, right? There's one, two, three, four, five, six. What's the name for a 12-sided circle? I can't remember. Whatever. There's 12 facets to the side of our sphere, um, and they're, they're sort of rotated all the way around. Is it a dodecagon? Okay, cool. So we only have 12 facets to a, a circle, right? That's not a very good approximation of a, a circle. And so the other thing that we have to verify is that our choice in which we have broken up the domain, right? The domain will always be these combinations of quadrilaterals and triangles. That should not impact our solution, right? If I change that domain, I should get the same answer, or change that mesh, I should get the same answer. We probably won't because right now we've got a very coarse um, mesh. So I'm gonna up the mesh. I'm gonna change my element size from coarser up to, I'm gonna push my computer. It's a fairly small computer. I'm gonna go up to fine and click build all. And so now you can see we've got a much smoother representation of our um, circle here. And I'm going to repeat my calculation. The comparison that I'm going for is what is this compared to 1.7933? So I'm just going to open a notepad real quick and make a, actually, I'll just throw it up in chat. That way everybody can see it. So the one that we're trying to compare to is minus 1.7933 e to the minus 7. So that was the value that we calculated with a coarser mesh. I've now got it fine. Um, and let's run this study again and see if it changes very much. Remember, we're not doing a parametric sweep here. Um, we've just increased the mesh size. I went from coarser to fine, depending on where you started. Um, you may have to change it somewhat differently. Right, if you were already on fine, 
maybe do the opposite, right? Switch back to coarser. Or if you are on fine, go to extremely fine or something like that. It, it just depends on how you um, originally set your mesh. Once you run your calculation, we can look at the line integration. Again, I'm gonna um, actually just to show you the error, um, switch your data set in your line integration back to solution one. Um, the parametric solution still exists. It's still stored inside of Comsol. So if you leave it as parametric solution solution two, um, it will actually continue to calculate based on the old settings. Um, so we need to go back to solution one. That's supposed to be a feature, not a bug, um, but it, I've made a fair number of mistakes by forgetting to update which solution is being calculated. Um, so switch back to solution one. And if we try to evaluate this, I think we'll get an error that says like, no, you can't put that into my table. Yeah, so this is the error. If you see something like this, number of rows doesn't match the table size, just clear the table. Um, you probably have stuff in your table from a parametric sweep um, that's still sitting there. Um, that's what this error means. So to clear your table, again, there's a little broomstick down here, um, which is clear table under table one. So I'm gonna clear that and then I'm gonna evaluate it again. Oh, it seems to have wiped my uh, selection for boundaries as well. If you clear the table and it wiped out your boundaries, then just reselect your boundaries on the um, sides of the sphere. So now I've got another value, minus 1.8970, zero, e to the minus seven. That's a big change, right? We had seen previously that this was a fairly stable value in terms of the size of the domain. It had sort of stabilized down to 1.79, but we just got it all the way up to one point, almost 1.9 um, just by upping the mesh of our system. This is another concept called mesh convergence. So when you have set the mesh high enough that you no longer have any changes in hopefully any of your numbers, but at, at the very least the number that you're trying to calculate, um, you have then reached what's called mesh convergence. Mesh convergence happens regardless of whether or not you're doing like an infinite domain, like we are here with a, a particle and a fluid, or if you're doing a, conf a confined domain. So if you're doing like flow in a pipe or something, you still have to worry about mesh convergence for something like that. Um, and so for example, when you're doing our uh, homework problems, um, you can mess around with the uh, mesh settings in there and find out how fine of a mesh do I need before things stop changing. Um, on the LPCVD reactor, similarly, um, you can up the mesh on there until things stop changing. Um, and as you can see, those differences can be a fair amount. Um, we went from what about 1.8 to 1.9. Um, that's a that's a pretty good size difference just for changing the mesh. Um, if I up the mesh one more time, now I'm really going to stress my computer. I'm not going to. Let's do extremely fine. Sure, you only live once, right? So now that uh, mesh density around here got even higher, I'm going to go ahead and run that study again. I'm gonna turn on some music because I don't think my computer can do that all that fast. So I am waiting for mine to run on its highest mesh setting and the largest domain that we've got. Hey, that wasn't bad. That actually did pretty well. Good job, little computer. I'm proud of you. And now we look at our uh, line integration again. Go ahead and evaluate that. Not as big a change, right? So now our line integration is minus 1.9146, e to the minus seven. All right, so if you're looking over in chat, we initially had a, a big change from about 1.8 to 1.9, but now going from uh, what we're at, like fine to extremely fine, the change wasn't quite as much. That's as high as we can go, um, at least with the defaults. If you want to change the defaults, you can totally do so, right? If you go back into mesh and you don't want to work in any of these physics controlled meshes from extremely coarse to extremely fine, you can switch from a physics controlled mesh to a user controlled mesh. If you switch to a user controlled mesh though, 
uh, it becomes a little bit more difficult to know exactly what each one of these parameters is doing um, because they are usually different meshing routines used for different geometries. Um, and they usually start from whatever the physics controlled um, mesh was that you had a moment ago. So if you switch to a user controlled mesh, you have additional options underneath mesh one um, that you can refine. If the ones that I tend to go to first are my boundary layers and my corner refinements, um, because those tend to be the regions where I have the most variation, right? Things tend to be varying the most, um, but you can also just kind of mess around with sizes um, to increase those sizes, right? If I look under size one, um, I can see a couple of different, you know, options around here. Um, if I go to like custom, something like this, and say maybe, I don't know, what would I like to see? Curvature factor, maximum L, no, I don't want to do any of this. How about boundary layers? Boundary layers, nah, I like most of those. Free triangular, nah, don't do those. Those are all out in the middle. No corner sizes. Mm, let's change our curvature factor, right? Maybe I don't know what it does. It's at 0 0.2, maybe he doesn't know it. Maybe he says, um, change the curvature factor from 0.2 to 0.1. Let's just see what happens. Okay, cool. So I have even more points now along each of these uh, edges for my sphere. Maybe I change my curvature factor even a little bit further down and go all the way down to 05. But how do I know what a curvature factor did? I didn't, big secret, I didn't know what it did. Um, I just tried different values of the mesh parameters to see if whether I think that that was relevant or not. Um, and so you can just kind of set the meshes to be um, to a high enough uh, resolution that you need. So if I change my curvature factor there all the way down to 0.05, I've got tons of approximations on here. Um, let's go ahead and compute that. I'm relying on my little tiny computer to try to do that. That's a lot of points for my little computer to calculate. If you're on like, okay, for an idea of how taxing this is to my computer, I believe I only have one core on this computer. Yeah, I have one core. It's currently running at 97%. You can do it, little computer. Uh, your mesh disappeared when you did this. Um, you may have to click the build all on the, the mesh. So up here on the top, there's a build all. Um, you might have to click that. If you click that and it still disappeared, um, switch it back to the physics controlled mesh and it'll sort of reset everything to its um, defaults and then you can run that. All right, so not bad. Well, computer did okay. Let's run it with that super high mesh and see what I got. 1.933, it's still kind of changing a lot, right? My 1933 is a fair amount of change. Um, minus 1.9335 e to the minus seven. Um, so, oh, sorry, that was an auto response to the person who just um, sent me a chat message. 335 e to the minus seven to everyone. That's still kind of a decent change, right? We're, we're changing it from 1.91 to 1.93. How do we know when we've stopped changing enough? Again, it comes down to what's your application and how much precision do you need? And to a, another practical extent, how much time do you have? Um, right, the, the higher your mesh settings go, if you're running parametric sweeps on like 50 different settings or something like that, that could add up to quite a few hours, um, depending on the type of simulation you're running. So it's a trade-off, right? How much accuracy do you really need? Um, it depends. Uh, for this particular example, I, I think we're probably fine um, with the mesh, mesh resolution that I've got. Um, the, there's a question in chat for the LPCVD report. Um, what kind of results should we be interested in? Um, there's going to be a, a summary of the, the types of results that we're looking for uh, that'll get posted along with the LPCVD model. Um, so you'll, you'll have an idea of what kind of questions we're, we're aiming for. The only way to export figures, um, you can use any of the tools up here, like Quick Snapshot, Image Snapshot, or Print. Um, those will export things. Um, you can also use uh, data exports. So your um, homework will have you um, export data. Uh, which you can then put into something else and plot it a little bit more 
uh, pretty. Like that. Yeah, you can do parametric sweeps for mesh settings. So for example, well, so you can do a parametric sweep for a mesh setting if you're doing a user controlled mesh. So over here on mesh one, if this is user controlled, you can do a parametric sweep here. If you're using a physics controlled mesh, no, there's no way to do a parametric sweep here. Um, the only way to change it is through um, these buttons over here. So usually I start off with my physics controlled mesh and I do three or four of them on the physics controlled mesh. And typically that's enough to get me a, a fairly stable answer. If things are changing like here, if I really needed this thing to agree, I might go a little bit further and do the, the user controlled mesh. Um, and so I might click under here, user controlled size one, right? I was changing this curvature factor. If I wanted to change that, I could label this as my curvature factor. Um, and so it's gonna complain, it turned it red and said, this is not a parameter, right? But I can go back to my parameter over here and create my curvature factor. Right? And I can assign it a value initially of 0, 0.05, something like that, I think it was its original one. Um, and so now I have a parameter here, which is directly affecting the size of my mesh down here. Um, and so if I were to add a parametric sweep, if I right click on results and say parametric sweep, um, under parameter names, I now have my curvature factor um, and I could sweep that over values. The only downside to that is the there's so many parameters that build up your mesh that it can be difficult to decide which one is most important. Usually it's the ones that are affecting the bounding edges around here, um, but that's, that's not always the case. But yes, you can do a parametric sweep over um, meshes. So I'm gonna switch my mesh back to physics. Extremely fine was plenty for me right now. Um, the last thing I wanna show you, uh, that, so those were the two big ideas, right? There was domain convergence, which is if you're dealing with something that's got a very large domain, like it's supposed to go to atmosphere or something like that, either you have to be really tricky with the uh, boundary conditions. So an example of that was actually the cooling fin that we did um, in our last lecture, where we just set it to always go as though the atmosphere, always transfer heat by Newton's law of cooling as though the atmosphere were 25 degrees C, right? That's one way of using a boundary condition to represent an infinite fluid on the other side. If that's not possible, like it is here, um, then what you have to do is make the domain bigger and bigger and bigger until your answer doesn't change. That's called domain convergence. Regardless of whether or not you're trying to investigate domain convergence, you've got to have mesh convergence. Um, and so that's just upping the mesh count or the mesh um, element size uh, until it's fine enough um, that you're getting a, a fairly stable calculation everywhere that you're um, calculating stuff. The very last thing that I wanted to do, this comes up on, you're going to practice it on the homework, um, and then there's also a walkthrough for how to do this for the LPCVT. I just wanted to show you how to do it once. Um, like, where do I go to, to get this information? If you want to export data from arbitrary portions in your plot, um, so let's go back to my velocity plot. Right, let's say I wanted to export values of my velocity out here and I needed to appear like on a grid or something like that. Um, you can ask COMSOL to do that um, by its export data feature. Um, so down here under export, uh, so I, I'm looking under results, way down at the bottom should be export. If you right click on that, uh, you can select data or plot or mesh or table or, or image or any of those. Um, you can even do an animation, which I think is cool, but I've it's a little bit more than we've got time for here. Click on data. Um, if I wanted to export like, I don't know, velocity or something, I could add my parameters in here. So under creeping flow, velocity, velocity field, maybe I just want the Z component. Or actually, how about let's do pressure. Pressure is a nice one. Let's select pressure whatever the expression is, right? You'll, uh, your expression will be provided in the homework um, and it will be provided for COMSOL, so, or for LPCVD. The only time you'd have to come up with the expression is if you're making your own project um, and you 
or presumably exporting something. And if I want to export pressure in like a grid, right? I want it at zero and 0 0.5 and one and 1 1.5 and uh, 0 0.4, 0 0.3, 0 0.2, 0 0.1, 0, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what you have to do is change um, points to evaluate in down here. Change it from take data set to grid. If you change it to grid, um, then what you'll be able to do is specify, I would like to output the pressure, which is the P up here, or whatever your expression is. I would like to output it at all of these values of R and all of these values of Z. Um, and COMSOL will use its own interpolation routines to figure out what those values are at exactly the points you're interested in. Um, so for example, in one of your homeworks, you're trying to get the um, temperature profiles at different locations in that tube. Um, and so you would use this kind of approach to do that. Um, you would set the R and the Z to give you the values of the temperature at the slices that you're interested in. Um, and then you'll do something similar in the, the LPCVD reactor. So just one way to export data um, is through a, a grid like this. And with that, we're done. That was our last regularly scheduled lecture ever um, for, L for 176B. Um, if we have anything extra um, that we might have to go over, um, I might do a quick lecture later. Uh, otherwise, we'll post everything else that we need uh, for LPCVD through Canvas. Um, there is one more quote unquote lecture, uh, which is like semi optional, but I'd recommend you watch it. Um, Dr. Kison Yang in our department has a walkthrough of our LPCVD reactor. Um, which is made with a slightly older version of COMSOL, but it's essentially the same. Um, and so that will be posted along with our LPCVD model. Um, and so I'd recommend that you watch that um, when you're attempting the LPCVD. And then as I mentioned earlier, all of the um, guidelines that we need for um, what you want to plot in your LPCVD and what you want to examine in LPCVD will be posted with the model. So thank you all for showing up. I'm going to wrap it up because I know we're two minutes over and I don't want to hold anybody back from any other classes. Um, but I will stick around in chat um, and answer any other questions um, that we might have. So thanks all. I'll throw Scheming Weasel back on. Um, I'll open up chat and then I'll start answering some, some questions on here. Stay safe out there. Where are you at, Weasel? There you are. What do I click next to export data? Oh, uh, so you'd have to populate your R's and populate your Z's. So let's say that I wanted it to evaluate at 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 1, and like 1.25, something like that for my R's. Um, I could enter it as a list as something like 0 0.25, 0 0.50, 0 0.75, 0 1.0. I could do that if I wanted to. Um, typically we need more than that. Uh, and so you can use these range buttons over here. So maybe I wanna go from R is zero up to 1.5 with a hundred values, right? I, I want a nice clean looking um, data set. I could do that. And then maybe my Z's, uh, those could run, I don't know, mine is 0 0.4 to 0 0.4, also in 100 steps. I could click add here, right? What, whatever the, the data density is that you need here, enter those as appropriate. Um, it, it depends on what you're being asked for. Um, and then you have to change your file name here. So you have to enter a, a file name of a location where it can actually save. Um, so if I were to do that, maybe I'll just go to, I don't know, documents, something like this and say my data file. All right, so mine is C users there and documents my data file, but it, it, you just have to tell it where to save. Um, and then once you're ready to do that, the button to actually get the data to go out is up here. It's the export button. Okay, you wanna, yeah, we can do two sweeps. Um, let's say we wanted to do two sweeps for the width of our rectangle um, and the height of our rectangle, right? And I don't know, as Dr. O said, I don't know why anybody would ever want to vary something at two levels. Um, it seems like a weird thing to do, but I'm sure it has relevance to something that somebody is doing. Um, let's remove some of these. Let's say my rectangle height. I'm just going to start this at... Uh, 
eight times one, eight, zero point zero eight. change our rectangle height back to 0 0.05 right? and maybe we wanted to switch these between two different values um, I just have to make sure that my um, geometry is set up so I would have to just change my rectangle over here to make sure that it's still doing the thing that I want um, just to verify that that's correct and then in order to actually do that inside of um, Comsol to do that kind of a parametric sweep if I wanted to sweep over both the width of the rectangle and the height um, I would right click on study and say parametric sweep and then add those two parameters under my parameter names so I would add two of them I would do our rectangular width and a rectangular height uh, and I can just populate my list here uh, as for example 0 0.08 and 0 0.10 something like that and maybe my um, height could be 0 0.05 and 0 0.07 right so now um, Comsol will evaluate this at the specified combinations usually though we want if, if for some reason you had some reason to do two factors um, we want all of the possible combinations so if, if you think back to what the uh, 2k analysis looked like we actually need every possible combination of those values um, and so you would change your sweep type to all combinations and then you would run it and you can have as many as you want down here um, we only have about three parameters we could potentially add a few more right if, if we wanted to change like mesh and do a, me a 2k on the mesh um, or whatever reason you would want to do that uh, or change the radius here or temperature or pressure or something like that um, you could do it in this this manner so if I click compute over here If you don't do the every possible combination, usually what that tells Comsol is, imagine just taking them in rows, uh, or sorry, in columns. So once my computer finishes calculating here, I'll, I'll tell you what it means if you don't do all possible combinations. Um, but I gotta wait. The little computer that could. Ta da! There we go. Uh, let's clear our table. Do our line integration for our second set of parametric solutions. Evaluate. So uh, you can see from the integral what it did, right? It, it started off at rectangle W at 0.08 and changed the height from 0.05. And then it did 0.08 again, it did 0.07, and then it switched the uh, rectangle um, up to its high value, and then swept through the, the low and the high over here. That's usually what we want, um, is, is every possible combination. The other option, though, that often does not give us what we want um, under parametric sweep, is if you don't do all combinations, but instead do specified combinations. Um, I haven't run this in a while, but my understanding is it will do just the combination of 0.08 and 0.5, and then it will do just the combination of 0.1 and 0.07, um, which can also have its uses, right? It, it's not exactly what we need, um, but let's go ahead and run that and see if my understanding of that uh, is still accurate. I could be wrong. It's pretty convenient, right? It'll basically just give you the whole 2K result down here, should someone be interested in that. I don't know, there's only 13 people in here, so maybe some people will have a leg up on doing a 2K analysis. So if I clear my table and reevaluate that, yeah, so that one, right, if, if you just do the specified combinations, it's doing exactly that, uh, which I'm so glad I, I remember. I haven't used that particular feature for a while. Um, it just did the, the pairs that we had specified. Um, which is not what we want. 
Yep, we're still recording. So just as a review, if anybody wanted that, use the all combinations. If you want every possible combination that you've got. You can get an idea too of why mesh and domain convergence are important because you don't want it to be any bigger than you need it to be, especially if you're doing something like all possible combinations. If each simulation takes 10 seconds and you've got 50 different combinations, that's gonna take a while. Um, it could take upwards of 500 seconds if you did something like that. That also makes it really easy too if you ever wanted to do like a 2k analysis for more than one response variable your line integration down here can have more than one uh, expression in it so let me clear this really quick i don't think i reread it so if that was my parametric sweep which it's not um, and i was interested in not only the stress but the pressure as well uh, i could go down here and add another term for the pressure. Oops, replaced it. There we go. So I have a, an expression here to integrate the pressure over that surface and an expression to integrate the stress over that surface. Um, so you can do 2K analyses with different response variables, right? And it'll still, you don't have, you only have to run the, the parametric sweep once and all those variables are stored. Um, and then you just have to change your expressions over here. So if you wanna know like, which one has the biggest impact on conversion or you know pressure at the outlet or, or something like that, um, you can just add more and more expressions to the data that you're calculating um, and, and quickly get those data out, which is nice. Seems like everything's calmed down quite a bit in here, so I'm gonna stop our recording.